Okay, let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining either live or watching the recording. Uh, this is going to be our first teacher success webinar series and the topic we've chosen is what does the new K-12 computer science framework mean to me? And we picked this topic because if you were like us, you, you saw this coming and you were perhaps somewhat concerned about what it would mean to you and how it Im would impact uh, the curriculum that you needed to teach and your daily life in the classroom. So that's what we're going to explore today. So by way of introductions, uh, my name is Chris Eust. I'm the president of CompuScholar. I've been doing software engineering for quite a long time, so I've spent uh, my share of years in cubes writing, writing lots of different code for different companies. I've also owned a consulting firm and kind of bring that perspective of an employer trying to find employees uh, to the curriculum. I've uh, been involved with CompuScholar for about nine years. We started back in 2008, so we've been writing computer science curriculum of some sort for kids since then. And I'm one of the co-author of all of the CompuScholar courses. So if you ever need to reach me for any reason, you're always welcome to email at chris.eust at copyscholar.com. So before we get started into the topic, I wanted to share just a few logistics about the webinar. So if you haven't figured out already, uh, everybody's on mute here in terms of the participants. So that way we don't have any background noise uh, bleeding into the presentation. If you do have questions, I highly encourage those. Uh, please just put those in the chat window. Uh, you can send them to me privately or you can send them for everyone to see. Uh, and I will go ahead and answer those questions as they're asked. So don't be bashful about interrupting. Uh, also, I do want to let you know this session is going to be recorded and posted online, so that way lots of people can see it, even if they couldn't make this initial session. And if for some reason we have any sort of dif technical difficulties and we can't continue the session for some reason, uh, we'll go ahead and record the remainder of it offline and we'll still post it. So I don't anticipate any problems, uh, but if they do crop up, uh, rest assured that the presentation will be finished, uh, recorded, and posted online. All right, so I mentioned the Teacher Success Program, and I did want to reinforce that this is part of our outreach to you. Uh, we want to be your long-term partner in computer science and CTE IT courses. Uh, that means uh, we're not going to sell you a curriculum and walk away. Uh, we do want to provide ongoing professional development and enrichment opportunities for you, uh, and these monthly webinars are one way that we want to reach out to you. Um, so the, the goal is to provide content that is meaningful and useful to you, so we certainly welcome your feedback and your suggestions. If you have a particular topic that you would like to suggest for an upcoming webinar, please let us know. Uh, if you have feedbacks on the, the content or the pacing of the webinar itself, uh, we also welcome that. So again, um, we're doing this for you uh, as an outreach to you, and so we value your feedback, and hopefully you'll let us know uh, what you think of the program. So what are we going to talk about today? Again, it's the new K-12 computer science framework. Uh, we'll review briefly the, the origin of the framework. We'll talk about who sponsored it and why they created this new framework. And we'll most importantly focus on the impact to you as a teacher and to us as a publisher. And I think we'll find that is, is pretty close to the same thing. We will briefly review the framework contents. The framework itself is very, very long, so we won't spend a lot of time going into intricate detail over uh, the, the specific line item details, but we'll show you big picture what's in there and how to read it if you choose to do that yourself. And then at the end of the presentation and, and at all of our webinars, all of our monthly webinars, uh, we will allocate some time for a little mini CompuScholar forum. So that will give us a chance to make some announcements that are interesting uh, to you as a teacher. Um, that will also give you a chance to ask questions and socialize about any CompuScholar specific topics that you like. So if you have a question or a comment about one of the courses uh, or the online learning management system, uh, save those up and ask those during the, the last part of the presentation, which will be the CompuScholar forum. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. So who created this new K-12 computer science framework? 
Uh, there's a rather large laundry list of organizations. So this is not a federal exercise, not a, a state or a government exercise, but a collection of nonprofits got together. So the Associated excuse me, the Association for Computing Machinery, Code.org, CSTA, uh, and other folks all collaborated as part of this. And if you look at their contributor list, there's there's dozens or hundreds of individuals as well that have uh, left comments and contributed. Uh, to the framework as well. So as you can imagine, uh, with a, a number of chefs in the kitchen, uh, the final product is somewhat complex and lengthy. That's probably to be expected. So why did they want to do this? Why create a new framework for computer science? Um, this is a, a, you know, computer science is a relatively immature subject uh, compared to many others in our education system. And so some people don't even know what computer science is. They really felt the need for a, a fairly clear definition of computer science. And so in their attempt to do that, you can find pages and pages of um, information on what they think computer science is and what it contains. Um, the secondary goal is also to help encourage computer science education throughout the K-12 ecosystem. Uh, historically, computer science has been a high school exercise and people are starting to realize that we need to introduce it uh, in middle school and even earlier uh, down into the elementary school system. So that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have kindergartners that are writing code, but we want kids at different age groups, you know, throughout the K-12 area to start thinking about computation topics and computer science topics and learning how to think in terms of algorithms and so forth. Another goal that was identified is to ensure that computer science education is what they what they called equitable or uh, is appealing to a wide range of diverse students. So there have been identified gaps in terms of gender participation, uh, race participation, you know, socioeconomic factors. And um, one of the goals of the framework is to promote diversity and ensure that curriculum and standards and so forth are appealing to all types of students. As I mentioned, um, Encouraging computational thinking is a theme, you know, throughout the framework and throughout the different grade levels. So even if you're not actually writing code, uh, you can still teach topics in a way that encourages computational thinking. So that is another goal of the framework. And then finally, the framework is designed to inspire uh, implementation. Um, and that's important because the framework itself is not a set of requirements or standards. Uh, it is a set of recommendations. So you would not take the framework itself and base a curriculum around it, um, but you would take the framework and use it to help write standards that would then in turn uh, spawn some curriculum. So big picture, that's what the framework is all about. And this actually came about pretty quickly. Uh, it was developed over the 2015-2016 timeframe. Uh, they did have several periods of public comment in 2016 and then finally sent out the big announcement uh, in October of 2016. So their main website is at k12cs.org. You can go there yourself to, to find all sorts of information. Uh, the, the heart of the matter is actually a 300 page PDF. That is the official framework along with lots of commentary and examples and so forth. And you will find that they also have quite a few secondary artifacts at the website as well. They have uh, different views into the standards, different crosscuts. Uh, they've got executive summaries, presentations, videos, spreadsheets, the whole nine yards. They've got it all there at that website. So I encourage you to go over there and take a look. So the framework is actually aimed at a number of different audiences, and we've kind of grouped them into three or four sets of people. Uh, the first set of people is uh, state or district level policymakers. So these are state level uh, boards of education, um, CTE coordinators at the district level, uh, people that guide allocation of funds uh, to different programs, people that help build course tracks. Um, the, the goal of the framework in, in that audience is really to inspire them and inform them of the, the need and necessity uh, for computer science and give them some, some broad strokes as to what um, this organization or this group of organizations thinks should be involved with uh, computer science education. So it's at that level, it's strategic guidance, 
its encouragement and inspiration um, at a very high level. The second group and what I would call the primary target uh, for the framework are actually standard writers. So as teachers, you all know that um, the curriculum you teach in the classroom has to adhere to some sort of standards. Your state will normally create standards with very fine detailed uh, requirements for teaching things like loops and arrays and logical expressions and so forth, uh, and perhaps in specific languages. So there's a, there's a group of people that need to actually write those standards at the state or the district level. And, and those standard writers are encouraged to take into account the framework as they, over time, uh, write new standards or modify existing standards. So the five core concepts of the framework and the seven core practices, uh, the expectations per grade level, all those things are funneled into the standards writers in order to help them shape new curriculum and new standards going forward. As I mentioned, the, the framework itself has no specific line item requirements for thou shalt do this, that, or the other at particular times, but it is a, a series of recommendations and general guidance that is meant to assist rather than mandate the way that certain things are done. Okay. And then the, the third and fourth group really are the people here on this call. So we are curriculum publishers, um, you are teachers, and you know the, the net impact on us uh, is essentially the same in that if you read the framework, uh, there's plenty of guidance in there around the way things can be done for equity and diversity. So again, making sure you know as we write our curriculum, as we teach it in the classroom, that we are sensitive uh, to those those needs and help encourage all students to get into computer science. There's also uh, a raising of awareness around what we would call soft skills, uh, which is not necessarily the nuts and bolts of writing code, but all of the things surrounding computer science, such as the cultural impact of computing, um, the need for communication and collaboration and teamwork, um, all sorts of things in that area that, you know, the, the ethical impact of computing and, and writing computer programs. So all of those things are part of the framework as well. And things, those are things that we can be aware of as curriculum writers, curriculum publishers, and teachers. And even though the framework itself, again, is not a set of requirements, you know, we might choose to supplement our curriculum or you might choose to supplement your classroom instruction with some of the core concepts and practices that you find in the framework if you think they will fit in. Okay, so the, the framework at its heart is a, is a group of core practices and core concepts. And there are seven core practices, and a, and a practice really is kind of a theme or an idea or a way of thinking as opposed to a specific skill set. And if you look at the document, a practice is going to have an overview, which is a, a very brief description of the practice. And then it will have a longer summary called a practice statement. And that summary really will say, by the time a student has completed the 12th grade, he or she should be able to understand and do X, Y, and Z. And then the, the third part of that is the progression, which is a series of goals you know, from kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade that say um, after certain grade levels, again, students should be expected to know or to be able to do or to be able to think in certain ways. And so that gives you, again, uh, the, the end goal, right? So after graduating 12th grade, here's, here's the way the students should be able to think and then recommendations for how to start building those thought processes uh, as the student moves through the, the elementary and middle school levels. Here's a, a quick example of one of the core practices, and I've, I've highlighted some things here in red. And you can see uh, at the top there, there's an overview, and that's the overview statement. Um, the, the practice, the name of this core practice itself is fostering an inclusive computing culture. So you see a little description about it. And then they've broken it into one or more practice statements, which again are specific ways of thinking um, that the students are expected to do. So for example, include the unique perspective of others and reflect on your own perspectives 
uh, when designing and developing computational products. So that is a practice statement. And then underneath that, you've got some narratives. And so the narratives, again, are, are breaking that practice statement, um, which is a kind of a 12th grade level statement, down into uh, ways that they can progressively reach that goal as they move through the grade levels. So uh, just looking at this top one here at all grade levels recognizes that choices people make are based on personal interests and so forth. Um, as a student progresses, they can seek diverse perspectives and so on. So this just gives you some, some context for how to reach that end goal, which is the, the practice statement. Okay, now there are seven core practices that are identified. Uh, inclusive computing culture, that's the one that we just looked at. Uh, collaboration around computing, so teamwork and ideas. Recognizing and defining computational problems, so what kinds of things are good for computers to solve. Uh, developing and using abstractions and uh, creating computational artifacts. And then the all important test and testing and refining of your artifacts. And finally, the communication uh, about computing. So, so again, we're not going to go into great detail on these things because there's, there's many, many pages in the framework about each one of them. Uh, but if you're interested, you can uh, open up that big 300 page PDF and starting at page 67, you will see the core practices listed uh, with all of the different uh, bits and pieces of information about them. Okay, the next part of the framework are core concepts. And core concepts are more tangible skills about learning specific topics. And again, there's five of them, and those are actually broken into multiple sub-concepts. And so uh, we'll, we'll take an example in a moment. Um, and, and these things are actually further refined into different grade bands. So after grades two, five, eight, and 12, the students should be able to do certain things. Um, the, the, each of these concepts has a summary, a longer description, possibly with some boundary statements, as well as links to related topics. And it all looks pretty intimidating because, you know, there's quite a bit going on here. So it, at the top, you can see this example is something uh, that this student uh, is expected to know by the end of grade two. Uh, the core concept is computing systems. The subconcept is devices. And then the concept statement says that people use computing devices to perform a variety of tasks accurately and quickly. And then there's some elaboration and examples there, along with related links to other uh, core concepts within the framework that are related to this one. And so you can see one of these core concepts is broken into multiple subconcepts. I've got a boundary condition highlighted down there at the bottom. It says, as a, at this grade level, understanding that computer information is coded is appropriate, but the explicit understanding of bits is reserved for later grade levels. So boundary conditions are things um, that students are explicitly not meant to know uh, by the end of this grade band. All right. So the five core concepts that I identified are computing systems, uh, network and the internet, data and analysis, algorithms and programming, and impacts of computing. So again, this is a, a fairly standard set of things that you're going to learn in just about any computer science class. They will teach you a little bit about hardware and software and how the, uh, how the internet works. Uh, you'll learn about data representation. You'll learn about how to create algorithms and how to actually write code and then the socioeconomic impact of computing and computing programs on today's society. Again, there's, there's far more detail involved here, um, and you can look at pages 87 and onward in the PDF uh, for the specific concepts. Okay, let's see, we've got a question here. The question says, does the K-12 framework recommend a pyramid approach to the computer science curriculum? So I, I believe what that's in reference to is um, what, what we call the pyramid approach here at CompuScholar is uh, looking at states that require you to do a sequence of courses, for example, Java 1, Java 2, Java 3, Java 4, in that order. And um, the, the framework is not directly related to the, the pyramid concept. Um, if you look at the, the core concepts and the core principles, uh, they're not really recommending a specific order that you learn these things in, other than at, at very large grade bands. So the 
the high school grade band between uh, ninth and 12th grade uh, will have a list of core concepts and, and practices that are appropriate for that grade, uh, but it does not specify any particular order necessarily uh, within the grade level. So uh, on the copy scholar side of things, uh, we actually tend to avoid the pyramid approach ourselves uh, just because it's very difficult to get kids to go through three and four years worth of the same uh, computer programming language and, and topics. We, we actually prefer uh, a broader approach that lets them take a number of different classes and technologies uh, in, a, in a very flexible manner. So that's just a just the way that CompuScholar tends to approach things with a lot of introductory courses that we try and, and use to hook the kids into computer science. Okay, now in addition to the main PDF, there are actually quite a few other documents that I mentioned. Uh, they've taken the core concepts and the practices and they've kind of reorganize them into a number of different views. So you can look at them by grade band, uh, you can look at them by the progression recommendation, or you can look at them by concept. So um, no matter how you want to slice it and dice it, the odds are they have a view for you uh, already up in their downloads area. So you can go to k12cs.org slash downloads and take a look there to see um, how they've sliced and diced things and, and pull out a view that lets you review uh, the line items in a way that's most convenient for you. <clears throat> so to kind of put a bow tie on this, the, the title of the session was, what does this new K-12 computer science framework mean to me? And, and so our prediction is that the biggest impact will actually be on the people that need to write new curriculum standards. So over time, as your state or district writes new definitions for courses, uh, the people that are writing those definitions for courses may well be influenced by the uh, computer science framework to include certain trains of thought and certain topics within the course tracks. So we think that will play out over a long period of time. Uh, it's not something that will happen instantly. As a, as a secondary impact, um, Certainly the, the momentum and the energy around the computer science framework will not be lost on the state and district level policymakers. So people that are in charge of allocating funds uh, and setting strategic goals and that sort of thing certainly will pay attention to the fact that there's a framework there. Um, however, those folks are also lobbied equally well or perhaps better uh, by organizations like code.org that already have quite a bit of information on their website about uh, the need for computer science and the importance of computer science um, within the, the overall educational space. So I, I, don't, I don't think too many state or district level policymakers are going to really sit down and consume a 300 page PDF, um, but they can look at the executive summaries and, and, and sense the energy around it and use that to help formulate their strategic direction. <clears throat> The, uh, the takeaway for us, right, as teachers and as publishers is, is really probably pretty minimal for now. Um, at some point, as our state standards change, we may see new things wrinkle into the, uh, the curriculum requirements. But as you know, um, as teachers, you are required to teach to the state standards that you have. And as publishers, we are required to write curriculum that adheres to the state standards that you have. And so nothing about this computer science, this new framework uh, at the moment changes anything uh, that is required of us. Um, it is merely a guide and a recommendation to the way that things may be shaped in the future. So um, we expect eventually uh, to start seeing as new course standards are released over the years that different states will you know, pay some degree of attention to the new framework and to start incorporating those elements. And that naturally will trickle into curriculum that we write and that will naturally trickle into the classrooms that you are teaching. So if you are waited with waiting here with bated breath, wondering if this was a freight train that was coming at you that was going to hit uh, right away, I think the answer to that is pretty safely no. Uh, but it's certainly something that is worth paying attention to. And if you would like to read through the framework yourself for 
inspiration uh, to evaluate the core concepts and the practices to see how well what you're doing in the classroom now matches up with what is the recommendation from all these organizations, then that certainly might be a worthwhile exercise. Okay, um, so as I promised, uh, at the very end of each of these sessions, we'll have a quick little CompuScholar form, and this is our chance to make some announcements to the community, and then also your chance for questions and feedback as well. So if you have something you'd like to talk about that is specific to CompuScholar, and not the uh, not the the topic of the day, not the framework. Um, then you can certainly ask that here as well. Uh, I see um, there's a question that came in. How well do the CompuScholar courses align to the K-12 recommendations? Um, that's actually a tough question because it's it's hard to write alignment documents. the The framework itself is specifically not a set of standards, um, but it is a a group of recommendations. And so um, where we would normally write state alignment documents that cross-reference chapter and lesson in our curriculum to uh, a, a, a outlined or a, a footnoted uh, requirement in the standard uh, doesn't necessarily exist. Uh, I would say big picture, we are aligned pretty well with the recommendations. Um, you know, the, the feedback that we get from our courses is consistently positive and um, you know, the things that I've seen uh, in the framework are by and large already in our courses. And um, I, I will also note that the authors of the new framework uh, had as a goal and went out of their way not to reinvent the wheel. So they certainly looked at many, many state standards that were out there and they, fa they found um, that, that people were doing things a certain way and that for example, classes were already teaching about ethical computing, and so let's include that in the framework. And so, you know, to that extent, CompuScholar is already aligned with state standards that were used uh, for inspiration and basis for the new framework. Um, got some other questions coming in here. So, um, are there any plans to make these recommendations mandatory at any level? Um, to my knowledge, no. Uh, the, the people that have created this framework have no sort of regulatory authority at all. You know, they're just um, nonprofit organizations and, and groups of professionals that, that can make recommendations and they can lobby people. And sometimes they might be able to lobby people pretty successfully, uh, but they certainly don't have the authority to go to a state like Texas or Tennessee or Florida and mandate that they do some things a certain way. So I would not see any of these recommendations becoming mandatory anytime soon unless the the nature of the framework itself uh, changes very significantly okay were there any more questions on the framework before we move to the copy scholar announcements okay so we have just a, a few announcements for you um, one as you have probably already noticed we have a brand new website so we're super excited about that and uh, we rolled that out about the middle of January, and we still have some some new features coming, uh, but we think it's a huge improvement over the old one. And so, if you like it, uh, drop us a note and let us know. Uh, a new feature that will be on that website shortly is a brand new support portal. So instead of just filling out an online form and corresponding with us by email, you will now have a full support portal that includes a searchable knowledge base a ticketing system for ensuring that problems are resolved and, and being able to review the problem history. And another exciting feature there will actually be some forums. So if you'd like to post on a forum and interact with other CompuScholar teachers uh, to exchange lesson ideas and, and experiences and so forth, uh, you will be able to do that on the support forums. So we, we are super excited about that as well. We hope you'll take advantage of that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention is that we have a new Unity game programming course coming out uh, that is scheduled for release in the fall of 2017. And everybody that we've socialized this course with so far has been uh, very, very impatient for us to finish it and get it out the door. So we are working feverishly on it. Um, this is a course where um, we are actually going to use game programming as a as a basis throughout the course for teaching coding. So as kids need to create new games that uh, require certain coding skills, we will introduce those coding skills at that time. 
<clears throat> and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we're currently going through a, a review and adoption cycle in Texas called Proclamation 2017. So we're almost done with that and it has been very successful for us. Um, so our courses have been newly aligned to some CTE IT courses uh, within the state of Texas. Um, we've done that for a number of states like Tennessee and Florida and Idaho and Utah and South Carolina and so forth. And if you are in a state that is looking at adopting or reviewing and adopting new material and you'd like for us to participate in that process, uh, definitely drop us a note and let us know. Uh, I've got a question that came in. It says, love the new website, by the way. Are there plenty of hands-on activities in the Unity Game Programming course? <clears throat> That's a good question. So yes, the, the Unity Game Programming course uh, actually has at least one coding exercise or, or one hands-on exercise per lesson. So we call these work with me exercises. And so when the kids read a lesson in the Unity course, they can immediately do a work with me exercise right there on their computer in order to build a little game or demonstrate a, a concept. And then we have our traditional activities as well that are submitted for grades uh, at the end of the chapter. So this work with me approach gives them very rapid and frequent reinforcement of the coding concepts, uh, as opposed to just doing one activity at the end of the chapter. Okay, um, question about um, the grade levels for the Unity course. So what grade levels is the Unity course targeted for? Uh, we actually have some students going through this course now as we're writing it in kind of a, a beta mode to, to actually gauge that. Um, our sense is that it will likely be a high school course, possibly uh, a seventh or an eighth grade course as well. So we actually have um, some students that are going through it individually on their own that are in that, that eighth grade level. Um, we've got classrooms that are going through the course at the high school level. So. Again, this is subject to some refinement here in the future as we as we close in on the, the completion of that course, but we expect it will be either 9th through 12th or perhaps 8th through 12th as a recommendation. Okay, are there any other questions on any sort of CompuScholar topics or any other feedback you'd like to give? All right, very good. Well, I definitely appreciate everybody's time. Again, this session is being recorded. And so when we get that recording finished up, we will um, we'll get it posted on the teacher success page on our website. And that way you can pass it around and um, recommend it to others if you found it useful. Thanks so much for your time, everybody. Goodbye.